We're returning to uh, the Future Blockchain Summit in Dubai, and joining me today is Richard Werner, Professor of Banking and Finance at the University of Oxford. He's an author of Princess of the Yen, a uh, former chief economist at Jardine Fleming Securities, and he's previously consulted for the Asia Development Bank, Japan's Ministry of Finance, and the Bank of Japan. Honored to have you on the show, Professor Werner. Pleasure to host you today. Thank you. Good to be with you. You are dubbed by the media as the father of quantitative easing. Why is that? Uh, because I made the first proposal for a new monetary policy, which I called quantitative easing. And it wasn't published in some, you know, um, a, a remote journal. It was published in the Nikkei, in the Nihon Keizai Shinbun, which is the Japanese daily financial newspaper, like the Financial Times. In fact, they own the Financial Times these days. Uh, it is the, the, the print newspaper with the highest print run. Yes. Well, at least for a lot of the time in the past, it was. I think the, you know, it's now getting harder for all the, the print run papers. Anyway, so it was in there, a big article published in 1995. And you have to know that, you know, I, I came to Japan um, and then very quickly analyzed uh, the situation and concluded that even though in, in 1991, the top 10 banks in the world were Japanese, and most people are saying, buy Japanese stocks, they're lowering rates, that's great for the economy and for stocks. I said the opposite. I expected that Japanese banks were going to go bankrupt and Japan was going to move into the biggest recession since the Great Depression. Now, that was slowly panning out. Um, most people thought that's crazy, impossible. Uh, it took years for people to realize that this is what was being, you know, um, sort of uh, unfolding there. And... Um, I have been working on solutions, how to get out of it quickly, what needs to be done. And it was clear to me, actually, then, that you could very quickly get out of it if the central bank takes the right policies. And QE1, my proposal was, because the problem is bad loans in the banking system due to excessive bank credit in the 1980s for asset purchases, the classic real estate boom bubble created by banks lending too much. Because when banks lend, they create money. And that is the game changer because it's like printing money, pumping it into the real estate market, you prop up real estate prices dramatically. But once you stop the music, once they stop trading new money and pumping it in, real estate prices don't rise anymore, they come down, you get non-performing loans. So actually that problem can be solved, the non-performing loans um, problem, which free, you know bankrupts the banking system. If the central bank buys the non-performing assets from the banks at face value, that's my first QE proposal. Stage two, QE2, is the banks will be so shell-shocked, even if they get bailed out by this without tax money, because it's the central bank doing it, without creating inflation, because there's no new money creation uh, as a result of this accounting transaction within the banking system. They're still not going to lend more, and the economy, therefore, will still be in the recession. So I had my second version of QE, uh, which is for the central bank to pump money into the economy newly through the banking system, by the central bank purchasing performing assets from non-banks. Now, um, the Bank of Japan for, for many years refused to do that. But after the 2008 crisis, other central banks thought, oh, this QE, you know, um, we're, we're going to do that. Now, to be, to be fair, actually, um, most copied the Bank of Japan's not effective version of QE. They didn't do what I, what I recommended. They sort of had a deviant Yeah, why, version. why is it exactly that they implemented QE but still had low growth throughout the late 90s yes. and low inflation. Because they didn't actually implement the right QE. Right. So my recommendation was, number one, purchase non-performing assets from banks by the central bank. And number two, the central bank buys performing assets from non-banks. The Bank of Japan, uh, six years later, they decided, okay, we'll do what this guy was saying. You know, First, they, they claimed it's not going to work, but in the end, they said, okay, nothing else has worked. We'll, we'll try this. Um, but they really didn't want a recovery. They only wanted to prove that QE doesn't work. Sure. So they did the third version, which is the Bank of Japan buys performing assets from banks, which is nonsense. It does, yeah. you know, marginally helps the banks, but it doesn't actually address the problems. However, the Fed in 2008 yes. adopted my QE1 proposal, yes. which is why the U.S. recovered first from the, uh, from the financial crisis that started in the U.S., and then the U.S. recovered much faster than Europe because the European central banks copied the wrong version of QE from Japan. Bernanke had been listening to my proposals and he implemented this QE1. QE2, the central banks led by the Fed, implemented in March 2020. 
but that's the wrong timing to do it because that's a measure to really balloon the money supply. They did it in March 2020 when there was no deflation and shrinking economy. That's what I designed it for in Japan. Uh, and actually, therefore, it had to create inflation. So already from May 2020, when they saw the data, I was pretty shocked. What are they doing? These central banks led by the Fed. This must cause inflation, significant inflation, 18 months ahead. And that's exactly what we got. So QE works, but you got to do the correct QE at the correct time. Monetarists might blame the inflation we saw 2020 to 2021 on quantitative easing, a limited QE in the United States, which may indirectly be as a result of your proposal. Well, how would you respond to that? Well, exactly, as I just said, I mean, they, the Fed implemented my QE2 proposal in March 2020, um, which creates a lot of money and expands the money supply, therefore must lead to inflation when you do it at a time when the economy is not in deflation. It's designed for deflation and shrinking economy. 2020 was not that time. It was 9.1% headline CPI in the line with your initial projections for how high it could go? Um, well, I expect a double digit, um, but basically we know that the official figures do understate the real inflation. So, I mean, I think in most countries it was actually double digit inflation. In your presentation yesterday, which I very much enjoyed, you were talking about the relationship between economic growth and interest rates, or perhaps the lack thereof. How would you evaluate the notion that higher interest rates today will not necessarily kill economic growth in the U.S. If the Federal Reserve doesn't cut rates anytime soon, we'll still have economic growth. Do you agree or disagree? Um, I agree because interest rates do not cause economic growth. That's a fundamental misunderstanding. Okay. That is, of course, what mainstream economic theory says, but it's not based on empirical evidence. There is no such evidence. There isn't. Um, and, I, you know, I did the first empirical study that in an, an open-ended and scientific way examines what is the relationship between interest rates and growth. And we found it's not negative, you know, low rates and high growth, high rates and low growth. That's a negative relationship. No, it's positive. And secondly, what about the lead lag? What about the timing? Which one is first? Economic growth comes first and interest rates follow. And that is why when we have high interest rates, that doesn't say anything about what the economy is going to do in the future because rates lag. Look at the Department of Commerce. Where do they have interest rates as a leading indicator? No, it's classified among their lagging indicators because that's what it is. And right. that is empirically true. Do you believe then that the Fed created asset bubbles post-2020 because of QE? Uh, yeah. Yes. And these bubbles, are they dangerous to the economic the economic system, should they pop? Um, of course, always. Okay. Um, so the real question is, why on earth, and really that's what you're getting at, why on earth did they do it? Because it's quite obvious what would happen you know, when, when you do that. If you create too much money for consumption, you get consumer price inflation. They did a whole lot of that. Amazing. I mean, it's, it's essentially, you know, 80% of the entire money supply that has been created ever by the Fed has been created in recent yeah. years. I yeah. mean, this is mind-blowing so massive so why did they do this um well here comes the next surprise um they they did this intentionally but it's not a secret plot it is not a conspiracy no they told us in advance it's it's right there just people don't pay attention go back to august 2019 there was a conference it's the the regular annual jackson hole conference yes. for you know, the central bankers, the Fed, and they'd invited BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager yes. by far. And BlackRock uh, was asked to present this paper. They presented their um, proposal, what monetary policy should do next. And you know what? It said, the next crisis will come. And when it comes, we must create inflation. Now, the interesting thing is they never give a reason why and they weren't even asked why, as if nobody was interested in that. But, oh, OK, we must create inflation. Yes, sir. And they said, um, oh, do it the way Professor Werner was saying in Japan, QE2. Um, they didn't actually mention me by name, OK? But they referred to my policy, uh, which I just explained, namely uh, for the central bank to purchase assets from the non-bank sector, which is highly unusual. Central banks almost never do this. You do this once a century. Um, sort of thing. It's very rare. And okay, that was the proposal. And then how do we know this is exactly what in March 2020 the Fed did? Well, number one, we have the data. It's exactly the data 
uh, for the Fed purchases that conforms to this, the data on the banks. So there were massive purchases of a corporate paper, yes. um, corporate bonds, and you know, non-bank assets from uh, from non-banks. But how do we know this is the BlackRock plan? Well, again, that's official because in March 2020, the Federal Reserve officially hired BlackRock and said, "Okay, that's your proposal. You do it. Go out and do it." They hired them, and it's on their website. You just check it out. Right. Well, the M2 money you bought above. The money supply growth, the M2 money supply has been contracting over the last 12 months. Yes. Um, negative growth we haven't seen since I think, the, I believe the end of the Great Depression. Is this going to lead to a severe economic contraction? Um, yes. Now, so the sequence is um, August 2019, uh, BlackRock says, let's create inflation. March 2020, implementation massive purchases of um, assets from non-banks by the Fed, pumping new Fed money through the banking system into the economy. It takes 18 months for this to work its way through, as I want, you know, in March 2020, I said we'll get the high, significant, double-digit inflation 18 months later. That's what we got. Fine. So you must remember the credit creation, you know, leads, and it takes one and a half years for, this, for, the, for the economy to respond. So what happened next, and that's what you're referring to, um, after they completely ballooned credit creation, after that, they let it sink back and it actually started to shrink. So we are now have shrinking credit creation, which means that economic activity is likely to now decelerate in the coming 18 months uh, quite significantly. Um, and of course, you can still reverse it. There, there are measures to reverse it, but they're not yet being implemented. So at the moment, our best forecast is to expect a serious deceleration of economic activity in the US and also in, in quite a lot of European countries. Deceleration in terms of in terms of GDP growth? Yes. Are we talking about negative GDP growth? Um, at the moment, it looks like the deceleration will go as far as shrinking the economy, negative GDP growth, yeah. Okay, let's talk about the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which yes. you worked on. Is this just some sort of Chinese plan to imperialize the world? Um, no, actually, I wouldn't put it that way. It is a Chinese plan, and they have long-term goals, and they're serious about it, so serious that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, and, and you know, they actually currently, in fact, today, as we speak, you know, the, the leaders are gathering in Beijing, um, particularly, obviously, the members of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is what, 130, 120 countries have signed up. Um, and there's the BRICS countries that are also supporting China in this. There's the Shanghai uh, Corporation Organization. They're all gathering today, the world's leaders, uh, in Beijing to celebrate 10 years Belt and Road. Now, to China, this policy initiative is important so much so that they have actually changed the constitution of the Communist Party and written it into the constitution. So it's something serious, fundamental, that they, you know, China wants the world to, to recognize is being taken seriously and it's a long-term project. So what is it? What is it actually? Now, here you have to understand the situation that China faced. So China well, was a developing country, but it's one of the very few, uh, one of only a handful countries that have succeeded in decisively moving from developing country status to developed country status um, in you know the course of the 20th century, uh, the, and in China's case, just a little bit after that in the 21st century. The other countries are Japan, Korea, and then uh, we have a region of China, Taiwan, yes. um, and Singapore. They've also succeeded. Now, well, how did they do this? And what about the other developing countries? You know, 80% of the world's population lives in developing countries. So what's been going on? Well, after the Second World War, the institutions were created for economic development, the IMF, the World Bank, and the international uh, development banks, and many other support groups, uh, many based and centered on Washington. Their policies and their development economics is known as uh, the Washington Consensus. Now, which country has succeeded in moving from developing country status to developed country status based on IMF World Bank policies? Yes. The answer is zero. There is not a single case. These policies have singularly failed. And the successful countries that have developed, and it's only, you know, Japan, Korea, um, 
Taiwan, Singapore, and China itself, mainland China itself, um, they've done it by ignoring the IMF advice and the World Bank advice, doing the opposite, doing what was forbidden by this advice. And so these countries have actually told the IMF and the World Bank, listen, you're taking, you're giving the wrong advice. What you're saying is not going to work. These countries will not develop. Look at what we've done. That's what you should tell them um, what to do. Japan, the finance ministry gave over a million dollars to the World Bank. So the World Bank responded, well, you, what you're saying has no basis in research publications. Show us the evidence. I mean, the evidence is the reality of these countries. And there are some publications, but they presented, oh, we don't know about that. Prove it to us. So they gave a million dollars from the finance minister to do this study, which is known as, is published, Oxford University Press, 1993 the um, East Asian Economic Miracle Study, which is basically watered down by the World Bank, but it shows, yes, they did different things. Uh, but still, the World Bank IMF did not change policy. So then next, China rises, thanks to the same um, high growth policies, fundamentally, China managed to have double digit economic growth for four decades, lifting more people out of poverty than anywhere in history. China also did the same as Japan and said to the IMF and the World Bank, look, this is what we need to tell countries to do, like China, like we did it. Uh, you need to change your policies. It's not working what you're saying. IMF World Bank uh, stonewalled. So China said, OK, well, we are interested in reality and results and helping countries and having prosperity for all. It's good for China as well. So we're going to have now an alternative program. So they create an alternative IMF and an alternative World Bank, the New Development Bank. Um, and the Asian Infrastructure Development, uh, no. Infrastructure Investment Bank, so in, in Beijing and in Shanghai, and the Belt and Road Initiative. This is the alternative to the failed Washington consensus policies that have, have actually not only failed to help any country to develop, they've actually ensured that developing countries would stay underdeveloped. They've been policies to keep uh, the developing countries down, dependent, and exploit them as cheap uh, raw material resource exporters. And my work shows exactly how they did this and what the tricks are. But the East Asian countries um, and the leaders there, of course, you know, Japan, uh, China, um, they've shown there is an alternative which is fairer, um, which actually works and lifts people out of poverty. And that's what China is simply implementing as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. So you see, you have to see it in the context of the failed Washington program failed for the world, but it's worked very well for the rich countries and for the elites because it helped them to exploit the developing countries, exploit the whole world for the benefit of this hierarchy, uh, you know, lorded over by the U.S. China's China is doing. No, I don't think so. And, and China, you know, and, and anyone dealing with China will see, will, will I think, uh, testify, um, you know, some countries that, um, that received loans from China and then got into trouble, they couldn't service them. Well, China forgave the loans and things like that. You know, they're really trying That's to help. Right. Well, shifting gears now, China has implemented its own version of a CBDC, central bank digital currency. And in fact, I believe 90 percent of the world's countries are ready to implement some sort of CBDC of their own. Is this going to improve monetary policy on a global scale? Um, China, I don't think it has introduced the Chinese version of CBDCs um, as, as a monetary policy tool per se. I think the goal is to have um, an alternative to the digital payment system that developed by the, you know, by the non-government sector in China and was dominated by two companies that are not considered government companies, you know, uh, Tencent and Alibaba. We've got uh, Alipay and WePay. And in China nowadays, certainly in, in all the, the sort of uh, urban areas, it's almost 100 percent of actual payment is done through that. And so the Chinese government said, well, OK, that seems to be working well. People seem to want to do that digital settlement and not using cash. Um, but they didn't quite like the fact that the, the government, the central bank, is not no longer part of this. So they thought, OK, we're not going to suppress this, but we at least going to offer a, a third alternative, which is the central bank's settlement system. And that's why they introduced it. So it's quite natural, you see. Um, in addition to Alipay WePay, but still most people choose Alipay WePay, so it's not really very important. But in the West, it's a different story. You see the secret services in the deep state thinking, wow, China, they have so many control tools, they're controlling the population. That's how they, they, see, they see this as something they're jealous about. We want to introduce uh, control tools and let's have 
programmable central bank digital currency as the main uh, monetary uh, means of settlement so we can control the population. And next time when there's inflation, we just take away people's money and then we end the inflation. So it's, it's a totally different aspect. It's like a, yeah. a Stalinist, a totalitarian <laughs> Soviet style uh, way of thinking they want to introduce for that purpose. That's not how it developed in China at all. Right. So I think in the West, we should be very weary of uh, CBDCs. It's a control tool. The programmability um, is really a totalitarian control tool. We should oppose it. And uh, we should refuse to, um, to, to use that. We should use cash. We should use uh, alternative digital settlement. Um, and we should make sure that community banks continue to survive. We should create community banks newly. Um, that's what China did. You see, the lesson yeah. in China is how did Deng Xiaoping, you know, manage to rev up growth, double digit growth for four decades. Um, he, he realized the Stalinist monobank system based only on central planning, the central bank is too centralized, doesn't work. Let's have thousands of banks. He created thousands of local banks, small banks, and that's why China thrives. And that's what we need to do today. Final question, I'll let you go, Professor. Won't CBDCs make commerce more efficient? Well, there is always that efficiency or convenience argument, uh, but there is a point when the convenience um, is, right. is a, it's actually the, the marginal increase in convenience is not that large. Okay. Right. So yes, maybe there is one potentially. I mean, it's not really that proven, but um, let's say there is one. It's not going to be huge, but also what is the cost? And the cost is handing the central planners totalitarian control tools over our lives over our money. Do we really want to hand them this power? And also the CBDCs actually usurp parliamentary powers because fiscal and budgetary policies uh, are supposed to go through parliament and democracies. But with CBDCs, they will go through the central planners. That is a Soviet system. I don't think we want that. Where can we follow your work? You have a YouTube channel, you have a Twitter channel. Yes, so YouTube Werner Economics, please you know, subscribe. Yes. Uh, and follow me there. There is a Belt and Road uh, clip recently, actually. Um, I've got Twitter, uh, Professor Werner, and Scientific Econ. Um, they are at the moment private, but you apply and I'll, I'll, I'll let you in. Can we read your paper somewhere? Uh, yes, if you go to my website, professorwerner.org, there's okay. all the papers, the scientific ones, some blogs. Uh, my book, Princes of the Yen, you get at quantumpublishers.com. Fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe and like uh, this video and follow Professor Warner at the links down below.